Welcome back. Today we're talking about acute otitis media, what we typically think of as a classic ear infection. This is the final video in our three-part series on ear pain. So if your child is having ear pain and you're not sure what to do about it, then you've come to the right place. So let's get started. So what does it really mean to have an ear infection? What happens with this type of ear infection is that fluid accumulates inside your middle ear space, and that fluid sits in there long enough for a little microbe to climb up into that space and start to multiply in that pocket of fluid. Once the bacteria starts to multiply in the fluid, your immune system gets alerted to the infection, and this starts to cause inflammation. This inflammation leads to swelling and pressure starts to build inside the space. This is when it starts to become painful. This pressure is in fact what causes the pain. It's also when we're able to start to see the eardrum bulge out into the ear canal. When you get diagnosed with an ear infection, what we see when we look in your ears is the outer canal and then the eardrum. The eardrum is usually concave when you look into the ear canal. It looks like the inside of a bowl, kind of. When you get an ear infection, the normally concave eardrum starts to give under the pressure from the middle ear. And so it looks like it starts to bulge out so that it looks more like the, the outside of a bowl. So how do you get an ear infection? The circumstances that lead up to an ear infection are actually fairly consistent. The typical course is the following. It usually starts with an upper respiratory infection, um, a, a cold. Uh, and there's usually a runny nose or just post-nasal drip, and those increased secretions in your nasopharynx get pulled into the middle ear through the eustachian tube. Now, if these aren't words you're familiar with, I talked about them in detail in part two of this series, and I'll link that video right up here and also in the description below. Once this fluid accumulates in your middle ear, it can get seeded by bacteria, which can then multiply. And this is how you get an infection in your middle ear space. The progression of symptoms is as follows. One, a child gets a common cold, or even just has the onset of their seasonal allergy symptoms. The cold starts out pretty unpleasant, and then after a few days, they're starting to feel a little bit better. And then in the second week, usually between days five and 10, they suddenly start to feel worse. Their fever comes back, their appetite goes away, they're up all night, they're clingy or fussy. These are common symptoms to look for to identify if your child is developing a secondary infection, the most common of which may be a middle ear infection. So arguably the part everyone's been waiting for, what do you do if you think your child might have a middle ear infection? How can you manage it at home? And how do you know when to bring your child to the doctor? Let's start with things you can do to help, and then we'll talk about solutions you may have heard that actually don't help and may cause problems. So when we're talking about what you can do to help, let's start with pain management. And then after that, we can talk about strategies that you can use to help the infection resolve as quickly as possible. What can you do firstly to help with pain? So the obvious answer is you can try a pain medicine. Acetaminophen is a reasonable choice. I might lean more towards ibuprofen or other NSAIDs, unless they're contraindicated for your child, just because NSAIDs are anti-inflammatory and that might make a tiny difference. But also, because the pain is caused by infected fluid putting pressure on the inside of the middle ear space, a lot of infants and toddlers will naturally put pressure on the outside of the ear, trying to balance out the internal pressure, helping them push on the outside of their ears, either by pressing it into you or pushing on it with their hands, can sometimes provide a little bit of relief. Some people find that an ice pack or a heating pad can provide some relief. Theoretically, it should be more comfortable to sit upright or to lie on the side with the ear that doesn't hurt, but I've definitely seen kids who found it more comfortable to put the heating pad down and place their painful ear over it. There's no right or wrong way to use a hot or a cold compress. You can feel free to experiment to find out what works best for your child. So here's what we don't want you to do. Don't put garlic cloves in your child's ear canal. Don't put ginger in your child's ear canal. Don't use eardrops that are originally prescribed for something else. And I say this for two reasons. One, if the eardrum is intact, then the drops are only gonna go in the outer canal, not in the space that's actually infected. And more importantly, two, if the eardrum isn't intact, then depending on the kind of drops you're using, some of them can damage your child's hearing. When these drops were prescribed, presumably your child's doctor looked in the ears and noted that the eardrums were intact, and therefore the drops were safe to use. If no one has done this in the course of their recent infection, then it may not be safe to use those drops, and it's just not worth the risk to their hearing to experiment. The next big question is, when in all of this do you bring your child to the doctor? If you suspect that your child has an ear infection and they are under six months of age, or they've had a fever greater than 100.4, or 38 degrees centigrade for more than 48 hours, or if they have any pain or swelling behind the ear. 
these are the criteria that we want you to look for to determine if your child should be seen because these are the circumstances in which we would be more likely to start a child on antibiotics. And so it would make sense to evaluate them because we would actually intervene if there was an infection. The next question is, what can you do to prevent ear infections? So one of the best things you can do is to try to get started with saline nasal sprays for them. A lot of parents will use the bulb suction to help babies and toddlers clear their secretions, but it's even more helpful if you can proceed that with a saline spray. In fact, if you can only tolerate wrestling your child into one of these two activities, I'd rather you use the saline spray and skip the suctioning. They'll ingest most of it, which is kind of gross, but, um, but not dangerous. And the spray performs a few different purposes. It helps to keep their secretions thinned out, so it's easier for them to drip out or be swallowed. Um, and because they have such narrow airways, when that mucus dries out and gets stuck, it makes it very uncomfortable for them to breathe through their noses, which is the most comfortable way for most people to breathe. And this leads to a breathing pattern that really freaks parents out. So here's what happens. <laughs> A child who typically breathes through his nose finds it unpleasant to breathe continuously through his nose and allows his carbon dioxide level to gradually rise while he holds his breath. Then when it reaches a certain threshold, he takes deep rapid breaths to blow off that CO2 and drive the level back down. Once it's low again, he goes back to holding his breath and allowing the level to rise. Um, so I get calls and questions all the time from parents who witness this rapid breathing phase and panic. If your child is doing that, Take a moment and unobtrusively watch them to see if they're also holding their breath in between those periods of panting. If they're doing the full cycle of breath holding and panting, then they're fine. They just don't like to breathe through their mouth. And that's okay. But if you see them breathing deeply and rapidly continuously for several minutes at a time, that might be a reason to have somebody check them out. So using a saline nasal spray will help them to clear that mucus and make this whole problem less likely to develop in the first place. The next benefit of saline spray is that by thinning the mucus in the nasopharynx and making it easier for it to be mobilized, it's less likely that the eustachian tubes will open up to equalize pressure and have fluid in the area to pull into the middle ear. If there's less fluid in the area, there's less fluid to get sucked into the middle ear, which decreases the likelihood of developing an ear infection in the first place. Another benefit of saline spray is that it helps to decrease the swelling in the nasopharynx, which decreases the likelihood that fluid will get trapped in the middle ear space by a swollen eustachian tube outlet. If the eustachian tube stays open, then fluid won't be able to accumulate in the middle ear, or at least it'll be allowed to drain out if it does get in there. And if there's no fluid stuck in the middle ear space, then you can't develop an ear infection. Another intervention that's been shown to decrease the frequency of ear infections is actually breastfeeding. Now, I know there's a lot of things breastfeeding is supposed to magically do, but there actually is some evidence that it can decrease the overall frequency of ear infections if it's continued for at least three months. There's actually not good evidence suggesting that breastfeeding for longer than that has a significant impact on ear infections. That's not to say that you shouldn't do it. That's just to say that it doesn't have a statistically significant impact on ear infection frequency after three months of age. So there's obviously a lot more to talk about. I'm gonna leave it there for now. Thanks for joining me. And uh, as always, remember that the best way to take care of your kids is to take care of yourself.